grace and peace of God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As you look at the situation when we open up the Bible and see the narrative that is in front of us, that is Moses being called, brought to attention, or it was brought to his attention that something was not right, the burning bush kept burning. And so he walks to that bush, and from there things continue to happen. Now the question I have, was it, was it something that he should have questioned? Should he really ask the Lord, what is your name? Why was he asking the Lord, what was his name? We'll be talking about that, getting into that a little bit. But I have another question, and that is that when things happen in our lives, when things come at us that we don't expect, and it could be the very side of excitement and and, uh, uh, praise, but it also could be backaches and, and other things, even more difficult things. When things come, is it fair for us to say, God, what is your name? You know, I don't think we actually say, God, what is your name? But I think we say, why, God? Is it really fair? When we look at what Moses did and what he was able to do with God's power, we realize a whole lot of things. One of all, we realize that there he was in the sight of God, next to the burning bush, being talked to by a voice, and a voice telling him that, He was the God of uh, of his fathers, of Moses' fathers, of of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. So there it was. I mean, it was told him. He had the proof. All he had to do is listen. He had been told earlier that as you approach this holy place, take off your sandals. So it wasn't like he didn't know who he was talking to. But yet, as far as the confidence that he felt... And the assurance that he felt and the courage that he felt was lacking. And so, yes, indeed, he did have to say, what should I call you? What is your name? You know, names are so important, as we had in our children's message. Names are so important. When we name something, you can grab a hold of it. When we name something, we can, you know, we, we can envision it. But the most difficult thing to name in this world, I believe or at least to understand, is God himself. And so, and so we have Moses asking at this particular time, what is your name? Like we ask at times, why is this happening? Like we wonder how true, and this might be true for some of us, not true at all, maybe in the past, maybe in the future, but just where do you, where do you get your authority, God? Is this really true? Oh, there's a movie, and it's an old one. It's open range. It's about cowboys, and of course, when I see it coming on, I watch it for about 10 minutes, right? And so there's a, there's a situation, there's a time when the, when the head uh, called boss uh, is... Uh, he, just what has happened is that the people that, that did not want open range uh, uh, killed a, uh, a, a worker of his... And so they dug a, a grave, and they were burying him as well as the dog that, they, that the outlaws or the bad people had shot. And so they said a few words, at least one of the individual, said a few words over the, the grave. And boss looks back and he says, I don't know if I can pray at this moment for a God that would let this happen to this good man. We do question. We do question. Now, the answer to him is another part of the story or maybe another part, another sermon. But the point is this. Moses was not just by himself as he was saying, what is your name? What should I call you? He needed reassurance. He needed to be assured that he indeed would be able to do this, that he was talking to and talking to the God of all gods. And that is when God dealt with him so personally, so reasonably, so understandably. As he deals with us, as we work through the difficulties of friends losing jobs, of ourselves losing jobs. And so what do we hear and what do we say as far as Moses saying to God, what should I call you? We would say, yes, God, tell us. What should we call you? Tell us 
who you are in this moment of difficulty, in this moment that we feel, in this moment that we felt previously, and maybe it's still a scar, maybe still there, and maybe we do have those regrets like this trail boss had those regrets, and he says, I can't pray to that God. Well, you see, there is evil in this world, and we don't understand all that evil, and we don't understand why, indeed, sometimes evil happens in our lives, and sometimes it doesn't. But we do know that God is a God above all things. And so there's two things that this whole book of Exodus teaches us and also this narrative of Moses teaches. That is, number one, never be surprised of what good God has planned. Never be surprised about what good God has planned. Number two, never be surprised about what good God has for you. What plan God has for you. Now, since things don't always happen the way we like them to happen, it's so easy to get pessimistic and think, this isn't going to happen to me. It's so easy to rally against God and say, why did you let this happen? But God is our God. God has a plan. Let's never be surprised how wonderful God is to us in this world and how wonderful God has a plan for us. When we talk about names as a creator and God, this God that spoke to Moses and then through Moses spoke to us is the God that said, I am who I am. We know also that you can interpret that. You can also say in a different way, I will be what I want to be, or I will be what I will be. Now, I like that a little bit. This might be a little bit of a curveball, but that I like that because it doesn't say, it says that there's things that we still don't know about God that are it's going to happen. There's still things Moses didn't know about God that were going to happen. And as, as we read in, in the narrative, as far as Exodus is concerned, we see the power of God in his life and the power. And what do we see? We see a creator, we see a redeemer, and we see a spirit. We see a redeemer that gives grace. And so even in the Old Testament, quite often it is confusing that we think in the Old Testament there's nothing except law and punishment. But in the Old Testament... There is chesed. It's a Greek, it's a Hebrew word, meaning grace, meaning grace. And so during this particular time, as the children of Israel were in captivity, they were led out of captivity, but the greatest captivity that they were led out of, and all of us are led out of, is the captivity of of sin. I'd like to go back just a little bit, though, and talk about God as our creator. And if you look at... And we're going to bring it up. One of the things that we know about the names, about the whole background as far as the names of God, is answered in your bulletin, but it's also going to be up here. What name is used in the Hebrew language for God? The name of God used most often in the Hebrew Bible is Y-H-W-H. It's also known as a tetragrammaton somewhat like that. A Greek for four-letter word. Hebrew, you know, is read from right to left. So you look at those letters. Y, H, V, T. Usually taken for consonants and expanded to Yahweh. In modern Jewish culture, it is accepted as forbidden, or another way of saying it, it's forbidden to pronounce the name the way that it is spelled. In prayers, it is announced as Adonai. And in discussion is usually said as Hashem, meaning the name. The exact pronunciation is uncertain because they quit using it. Quit saying it out loud in respect for the name. And, if, and we don't know for sure. The Tetragrammaton first appears in Genesis, occurs 6,828 times in total in a particular text that they're referring to. It is thought to be an archaic third-person singular imperfect tense of the verb to be. Some of you understand all of that. Third-person singular imperfect tense of the verb to be, like was being. 
This agrees with the passage in Exodus where God names himself as I will be what I will be using the first person singular in perfect tense. Now here's something that perhaps might be a little bit helpful besides other things which I think also are helpful. But this is just a little tip. Most English trans- translations of the Bible write the, the Lord. Look at how Lord is written in capital letters. So whenever you're talking about Yahweh, and say Lord, it is capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. The sovereign Lord for Adonai, instead of transcribing the name. We say Yahweh or Jehovah, and it is proper to say Yahweh or Jehovah. In the, in the, first, in the first book of the Bible, in Genesis, it talks about the Creator God, and it uses a name which is which means powerful and wonderful uh, it, it is a it is the name that I can't find right now let me come back to that Priscilla probably knows The Creator God was known by the name of being a creator. And when we talk about creation, when we talk about the world, when we talk about how the world came about, the pressing question is, you know, where did it come from? And so when we look at creation and the Creator God, we speak of, you know, as far as the east is from the west, as far as the top of the mountain is from the bottom of, of, the, of the, riv- the deep crevice in the ocean. We talk about it's impossible to pin God down. I was reading a recently a, a little article by a man by the name of a uh, scientist, a Christian scientist by the name of Schrader, and he said that 50 years ago, 50 years ago, nobody, no scientist, would indicate that the earth had a beginning. It was thought, the universe was thought to be eternal. Okay? And, but from 50 years ago, this has changed. Now, not all the scientists would agree with this, but most of them understand because of what has happened in the science, scientific field that we now can hear the, the beginning of the world, as they call it, and it was often referred to as the Big Bang. Did you know that, well, let me ask you this question. The universe that we live in, the galaxy that we live in, let me straighten that out. The galaxy that we live in is what galaxy? Anybody? Stanley? The question, the galaxy that we live in, the one galaxy, what's the name of it? Milky Way. Yeah. yeah. You all knew that and were afraid to say it. All right. Milky Way. That's one galaxy. Do you know now, because of the telescope, telescopes, how many we can identify how many galaxies they are? A hundred. I was going. To, I, I said this earlier in preparation to as, as I was talking. I said this earlier. There's a hundred million, and then I looked at my notes, and it's a hundred billion galaxies. Hundred billion. Fantastic. So probably even a few more, huh? Okay. So the point, and this scientist also said that, you know, as far as trying to understand, and this is the one thing that I want to share with you, as far as trying to understand the universe, the whole thing, think of it as a cylinder, okay? It had a beginning. It's going to have an end. It had a beginning. It's going to have an end. And surrounding it, surrounding it is not space, but surrounding this is emptiness. Nothing. And he said, we can't comprehend that. It's impossible to understand because we think of space as having, having time, of having energy, of having movement. But outside of this great universe with all the galaxies that we have, that's the I am who I am. That is the creator.
I know, I shouldn't be looking for that word, but I still am. <laughs> Makes me mad. I'll tell you on the way out. Okay. What did you say? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Anyway, it's a different it's a different name in the beginning in Genesis. It's the same God. Same God. Different name. And we have in front of us then what as far as what is here, what is now. How does this apply to us? And who is this great God? So when we move along, we see, I mentioned something called Chesed, grace. And it might be somewhat new for those that have not heard this before, but the Old Testament is leading towards and talking about the Redeemer, the Christ. And there are indications of that. It's interesting that that word for God, the Creator, was a plural. It's a plural word. And so there's a hint that the Creator, the triune God, contains more than what we can understand, just like we cannot understand what is outside of this world, which is nothing. But nothing means something to us, but this is nothing that we can't comprehend. And God is in charge of it all. There's two things we should never forget. That God has amazing things that are going to happen in this world for us. And God has an amazing plan for us individually. And so, I don't know whether you're sitting outside listening on the, uh, over the intercom or if you're sitting in the back working hard back there. But, the, but God talks to us personally, directly. Jesus was there. As we know from John and, and the first chapter of John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, Word meaning Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And when Jesus was challenged, challenged as far as who are you and how, why are you speaking this, the Sadducees said in, uh, uh, challenged him with this, and in Mark 12, he says, Have you not read in the book of Moses, in the story about the bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. They challenged him because he had said and did say, I am. Meaning that he was this God, this creator God. Again, how can we understand it? What we can understand is this. We can understand that at this particular time of our lives, the difficulties, the situations that we have... The, the uncertainty that is, that is always part of this life that we live in, the uncertainty is always come back to looking at who is this God? What is your name? And the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the name of God the Father, the name of the Holy Spirit, is the name that we heard said as we read the Scriptures, said to Moses, and Moses then was able to go back to Egypt with the power of God going through all of the plagues convincing the, convincing the Egyptians that God wanted them to leave but not convincing them finally was able to lead them out through the Red Sea never be surprised about what God has planned for this world and never be surprised what God has planned for you and in his name the I am we say Amen <laughs>